two years before he shot himself, a young man at the age of 37 started painting. And this is a man who, as a child, had drawn the picture of a family cat. And it was so bad, in your parlance, an epic disaster, that he destroyed it. And from the time that he was a boy to a young man, this guy worked as an art dealer, a book shop clerk, an assistant teacher at a boarding school, a tutor, a preacher, and was an epic failure in all of these. And then he started painting. And he was also prone to clinical depression. And once when he was at the St. Paul Asylum, one starry night, he looked out of the window and imagined himself seeing the inky blue night, the village, the rolling hills. And he put onto the canvas what he saw. And you and I and humanity is richer by what we call now as starry nights. Any guesses? Vincent van Gogh lived only for 39 years before he shot himself. In between, he chopped his ear as well. And it was only in the last two years of his life that he actually started painting. When did he start? Is it the moment when he put his painting brush to the Or is it the moment when he took the paint off and decided to look out of the window and see the inky blue look at it and paint it with the vividness of color and with aggression of strokes, that he in fact started a very school of painting. So where does it all begin? And this is the point where we have to unpack Aramb. David Epstein, in his book, The Range, says that he was a nature walker. As a boy and as a young man, he would walk through storms, through nights, through rains, and he was a confessed, you know, self-confessed nature walker. And he also worked as an art dealer with his brother, which meant that he spent a long, long time with lithographs and old paintings. So he did have time and he did have the space to go through a lot of form, to ruminate about the beauty of color and shape. And so the processes which led him to put the paint on his brush and to the canvas. When did it actually start? When uh, the organizers gave the topic of Aramb, I was looking for a suitable translation in English. Is it beginning? Is it origin? Is it start? But in the next 10 minutes, I want to argue that it has all begun even before we start. And that is the phenomenon called processes. This is the painter, uh, a self-portrait with his ear chopped off. Arundhati Roy, in her, the Booker Prize winner, in her award-winning novel, The God of Small Things, has this beautiful quote. And she says, still, to say that it all began when Sophie Mall came to Imanum is only one way of looking at it. Equally, it could be argued that it actually began thousands of years ago, long before the Marxists came before the British took Malabar, before the Dutch ascendancy, before Vasco da Gama arrived, that it really began in the days when the love laws were made, the laws that lay down who should be loved and how and how much. So if we think that it begins only with us and that we have met that one person whom we are supposed to love, we are not correct. It was all decided and predestined when the love laws were made to be decided who to be loved and how and how much. So where does it all start? The processes. In a society that puts so much of emphasis on success, on overnight success, what is the premium on processes? Have you seen behind the scenes of a movie at the end of a movie? After two and a half hours, after three hours, it is as if nobody wants you to watch that. You know, we, have, we are running uh, with full bladders, with angry kids who are hungry as well. There are cabs which are waiting. But those five or six minutes when it is actually made, when they actually show you the behind the scenes, the goof ups, you know, the falls, uh, the, 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 no, the no filter, no makeup looks, the slaps, the stunts, all of it, 
that five or six minutes summarizes the two and a half hours of what we see. And the stage, whatever has been set up, it's not that it came up today. There is a tremendous process of thought and action that has gone on the part of the organizers to put it all up. And for all of us to gather here and converse on what Arimp means for each of us. And that's the beauty of a conversation on something as, as, um, as, as mundane, what we, what we may call as beginning, but it all began before we even started. And this is also a good time for me to seg from Vincent van Gogh to Arundhati Roy into my own personal journey. In 2015, I was selected, um, I was offered a seat at the School of Government in the University of Oxford to read public policy. I was 37 years old and the mother of a 10-year-old child. This is not really the arumb of studies that, you know, society would ask one to believe. Yet, I took it with my full hands. I had applied, gone through a gru I had applied and gone through a grueling interview to actually get, uh, get hold of that seat. But if you were to t say that you know, this began only in 2015, no. This was the result or an ambition of a student from age five, was not very gifted, but was more hardworking than any other student uh, in her school. I was blessed with, I am still blessed with a good memory that makes me uh, you know, go through pages and remember where the words uh, are. I used to read from, you know, newspapers in which loaves of bread, grocery used to be packed. I have written in old diaries. I have written on the back of wedding cards, which come in three, four layers. And that was the kind of hard work and commitment with which I would apply into academia, academics as a student, and whatever I was given. So if you think, and you know, if when the introducer says that, you know, she has gone to world-class institutions and universities, it's not something that began there. There has been a hell lot of work which has gone behind. From 1995 to 98, I did my Bachelor of Arts in St. Teresa's College, Ernakulam. And if ever there is a question to look back and wonder what I achieved, however little it is, and what made that of me, it is to those three, three years and the lovely set of teachers that I had. I was nurtured by the then principal, Reverend Sister Emlyn, who had ambition and who instilled that ambition in all the girls that she saw. She was also the one who led us to believe that there is nothing you cannot achieve. And so when the experienced mind of a teacher like that met us, the possibilities were infinite. We went on to competitions, uh, we traveled all across India, and there was never a word uh, of no. So that was the, the beginning uh, of the process of me as a student. We will put that girl on hold there and say uh, it to 2000 um, and 2001 when I was in JNU reading history um, at the university. Hours and nights and days spent at national archives, museums, rummaging through colonial papers because I was specializing in modern Indian history, the theory and practice of colonialism. And all that, um, you know, that I had, I had been employing there too in a national and an international university of JNU's repute was the academic discipline that I had grown, the muscle memory that I had grown as a child, as a student in school. Since majority of you are students, I also want to take a time, uh, you know, in between this talk to give you two principles. One is the forgetting curve, which a bloke called Ebbinghaus had developed. Ebbinghaus says that, you know, whatever information that you gain, you tend to forget it at, if you do not revise it in spaced intervals. And we have come from Asian households where we have always listened to do your daily portions, right? How many of you have heard that in your homes? Do your daily portions, revise. And that's based on a very, very scientific principle. Just after the lecture is when you forget everything. Ebbinghaus's, um, uh, Ebbinghaus's uh, you know, experiments would prove that to you. You give it more time, you will tend to forget. And then, so in order to keep your memory up, what you have to do is to revise small bite-sized chunks of information at spaced intervals. This is what they call as daily portion revising, weekend revising, have a revision plan, write down what you have learned, do, do bullet points. See, we Asians have figured it out all. I mean, you know, as far as academics and studies is concerned, we have, we have uh, done that all. And in 2012, the British Olympic cycling coach, Brailsford, called it his strategy of aggregation of marginality of gains. 
I repeat, aggregation of marginality of gains. And he says, if you want to be adept and skillful at something, you unpack it and do it every day and try to be better by 1%, by 1%, you will end up being better than 90% of those who have that skill. You see practice, you see revision. And that, that's, that's the whole idea of going through the discipline of process. It's not where you begin, it's not where you start, it's where you begin the processes. And that's what I want to stress on for the next five minutes, right? When I moved uh, uh, to NIFT on deputation from the Mi Ministry of Fi uh, Finance to Ministry of Textiles in 2018, this was two years after I had returned from Oxford, and so the doubting Thomases had to say that, you know, she's been in the Ministry of Finance, what's she going to do in textiles? But this is also the girl who had spent hours in the National Archives and, you know, in the museums, rummaging through materials and learning about history and going through materials uh, to understand what handloom is, what craft is, what interdisciplinarity of studies is. And so since 2018, August, I head the NIFT Bengaluru campus and we do fashion studies. And we brilliantly delve into the interdisciplinarity of academia, wherein we deal with identity politics, we deal with uh, you know, history, we deal with culture studies, we deal with gender politics, whatever you can, call, whatever you can think about, the chemistry of dyes, the, the mathematics of cutting angles and cuts and silhouettes, uh, technology of AI and robotics and fashion, we are all doing that in, uh, in there. And that's, uh, uh, that's also, I mean, you know, the saging or the coming together of the student who was nurtured by good teachers and who also saw the potential of what a person in power can impact a younger mind is. So I grabbed the opportunity and NIFT so as to fulfill, or so as to manifest the desire to be a Sister Emmeline to thousand odd Susans who are there in the campus. And that's the impact that I want and never shy away from coming into educational institutions because you guys will steer the future. And, so, and that's how the dots connect. The dots always connect. And there is a fabulous quote uh, by Steve Jobs on this, that you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You can call it karma, you can call it destiny, you can call it your gut, but it will always connect. Whatever processes you go through, it will always, always connect. And so what's the story of Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs is a college dropout. But in 1972, he saw the poster for a calligraphy class in Reed College and went on to audit it. Auditing meant that you would not get credit for it, right? So uh, he audited the course, and for the first time, he saw the difference between sans serif and, you know, um, the other fonts. He understood the spacing between typefaces, and the, the, the world of aesthetics opened up to him. And he called it historical, he called it subtle, and he called it so beautiful that science couldn't capture. And 10 years later, when he was sitting down to design the first personal computer in the form of Macintosh, all that aesthetics and calligraphy came back to him. And Macintosh became the first computer that offered you a wide variety of typefaces. And then the rest of them followed or copied. So if we are sitting on this, on, on the multiplicity of typefaces and the beauty of design, science and technology marrying the beauty of, beauty of design, it is this one man who introduced, who dropped out of college. So that, do we trace it back to the calligraphy class? And do we trace it back to that calligraphy class, which he was able to do because he dropped out of college? So you see how processes connect. It all begin. There is no beginning and there is no really an end. It is the continuum that is life. And this man who also gave us the beauty of design and Mac, look at the beauty of the design in a year pod. This was a cartoon which was on New Yorker. You know, these two cute little things that we call year pods with their mouth and with their eyes. Most of us are emotionally attached to these devices, you know, and Apple and Mac are aspirational for many of us in this generation. And that's all the connecting of dots of one person who decided to marry, who decided to bring design onto our tables. This was one of the first reels. I get those goosebumps every time. This was one of the first reels that went viral on my Instagram handle at Afsarnama. It garnered more than one million views. And a lot of my friends said that, you know, nobody wants to see uh, how to format an assignment. People want to see your cappuccino and, you know, the aesthetic of your OOTD and things like that. But 
academics and formatting an assignment, come on. But it did go on to run a 1.2 or 1.3 million views. And that was the authenticity of the experience that I brought in. The authenticity and, and you know, did, it, did I begin when I started recording the reel or when I pressed the share button? No, it began all that way back as a student who, 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 was, who paid pernickety attention to her academics, and did give fact boxes and, you know, formatted her assignment in a particular manner so as to get good grades. But the way it has come out in an Instagram reel 20, 25 years later compels me to argue ladies and gentlemen, that there is really no beginning and no end. All your dots, all the processes connects brilliantly and beautifully. In a world and a global culture that is fixated on overnight fame, five minutes of viral, I want to argue that it is the processes that you have to pay attention to. You know, the, the minutes that you spend uh, on the yoga mat, doing your core, uh, you know, struggling through your plank pose, the rough notings that you do on the margins of your exam paper, the equations that you saw in the paper. These are the processes and these are, you know, the early morning waking up, the making of your bed, it starts with that. It starts with that discipline, it starts with that process. Eventually, that is what is going to stand you in good stead. And so trust the process and shine where you are. Thank you so much.